Happy Easter, everybody. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're so excited you're going to get started tonight. Hey, we are about one name. His name is Jesus, and we're going to celebrate what he's done for us tonight. I want to invite y'all. Man, what, isn't that a gift that the story of the resurrection is our story? Like, like that story of stepping from death to life is the story that God has given me through Jesus. And man, I'm just so grateful for that. 
So grateful that you're here with us tonight. If I hadn't had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Alan. I'm one of the pastors here at the Anderson campus. And right out here back this aisle, we have a guest services area that we would love to greet you at after the service to introduce you to ourselves, to our church, to kind of what we're about. But we don't want to just introduce you to us. We want you to introduce yourselves to one another. So I'm going to put a minute on the clock and I got two questions. All right, I'm going to set the bar in two different places. One, if you know the person next to you and you're trying to take it to a deeper level, I want you to ask them what their favorite Easter memory is. Two, if you don't know them at all and you're just looking for that kitschy thing to grab a hold of, what's your least favorite Easter candy? Least favorite Easter candy. So we'll put a minute on the clock. Go. You guys did great. You did great. Normally we like run out of things to talk about with about 15 seconds to go and y'all are still going. You can make your way to your seat and grab a seat. I want to tell you about something really special. Hey, we know that a lot of people step into church for the first time around this time of year, around Easter. And we've had this amazing partnership that we've been leaning into over the last month with an organization called Illuminations. So if you're new here, if this is your first time with us, if you would take out your phone right now and do me a favor, and if you've been coming for more than 10 years, take your phone out too, and that way it'll be less conspicuous for people who are here their first time. This organization is seeking to see the Bible translated into, la into languages that it's not yet translated into. And so we want to give you a gift if you're a first timer with us back at our guest services area, but we also wanna give a gift on your behalf and so if you'll scan this QR code and just let us know that it's your first time with us, we're going to donate $100 to this organization that agrees with us that the gospel is the key to the life that God means for us to have. So we would love to, to have you participate in that with us. It would be a blessing to us for you to allow us to do that on your behalf. If you've been coming for a little while and you're interested in what our church is about, we'd love to invite you to connect. Connect is our four-week class. It, informs you a little bit about what our church is about, lets you meet some people and participate with hosts around the table that are volunteers with our church that can help you figure out where God is calling you to serve and to plug in with our church and helps us realize how we can better serve you as you step in to what God's calling you to do here. And the final way that I wanted to make you aware of that you can plug in is you can always plug in through giving. And I wanna say that with a caveat because I know that there are some guests here tonight if you're a guest here, please don't feel any compulsion to give. Like, that's not what we want for you. God has something for you tonight, and we don't want anything to get between you and what God has for you. And we know that sometimes the church can be seen as this thing that, well, all they want is their money. That's not the case for you. So if you're one of our guests, feel no pressure to give. If you're a part of this church family and you feel called to tithe, you can give using our give boxes. You can give through the web, or you can give using our app. But I want to just take a second and pause right now. We're sitting on what would be silent Saturday in the church calendar. And so we want to recognize the fact that we are between what God did through his son at the crucifixion and what he provided for us through the resurrection. And the reason that we can look forward to the resurrection is that we don't grieve without hope. We know the end of the story. And so I want to take a moment just to center us, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to celebrate together because we know how the story ends. Father, thank you for bringing your people together on a night that is cold and rainy, and Lord, candidly, all the things that it should have been based on what was going on on the earth 2,000 years ago on the Saturday between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Lord, remind us of your faithfulness. Fill us with hope, Lord, because we know the end of the story. 
So we invite you into this space and thank you for what you're always so faithful to do. Thank you that we participate in the resurrection. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, church, if you would go ahead and stand back up with us. I want to extend an invitation for you all just to worship along with us tonight. Christ redeemed us on the cross, became our sin, poured out his love, crimson glory washed over us. Christ redeemed us on the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse he drank the cup that i deserve the grace of god we could not earn christ redeemed us from the curse i need every voice to sing praise the savior Praise the Son, friend of sinners, who rescued us. Let every breath join heaven's roar. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Christ redeemed us once for all.
Father God, we thank you tonight on this resurrection weekend. We praise you across the state of South Carolina. We worship you and we take our voices and join them with the chorus of millions of followers of Yeshua for 2,000 years who stand today with hope in our hearts because you got out of that grave. And so we praise you. So church, would you help me right now? Would you lift a shout, clap your hands? Let's praise the Lord one more time. We love you. We hail your name, King Jesus. Be honored tonight in our gathering. In Christ's name we pray. And everybody said together, amen, amen, amen. Hey, before you take your seat, could you give a high five near you? Could you shake a hand, turn around and wave at somebody across the aisle, say hello, and then you can grab your seat. God bless you, God bless you. Well, hello church, it's good to see everybody tonight. How you feeling everywhere? Everybody feeling good? Well, I wanna welcome you, Anderson Campus, can you help me welcome the folks that are joining us online and at all of our other campuses tonight? You might have had to swim here. I'm gonna blame Clayton. He talked about pollen last week, Clayton. You talked about pollen and, and the Lord wanted to make sure that Easter Sunday morning we have no pollen. It's all gone. And so uh, we got a lot of rain if you're watching from other places in the world. And I'm glad that you're here. You look great. Uh, the old youth pastor in me, I decided to trade in the hoodie for the adult hoodie and put on a blazer tonight. And uh, if you got your Bible, I wanna invite you to open them up. We're gonna be in the Gospels tonight. Luke 22 is where I'm going to start in just a bit. And if you want to open up your app, we've got all the notes preloaded there. And I hope you will be encouraged tonight as we get to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, uh, and I'm so pumped. I hope you are too. I want you to write this down. Here's where we're going to be tonight. Easter is very simply this. Easter is the celebration of how God can take what the enemy intends for evil and he can use it for good. Let me say it again one more time. Easter, this weekend, is our chance to celebrate this reality that God can take what the enemy, Satan, intends for evil and use it for good. This is the story of the gospel. It's the greatest news that anyone could ever share that there can be horrible things in life that occur, there can be setbacks, there can be failures, there can be complete mess ups and mistakes and there can be sin in a fallen world and that there is a God who sits over top of all of that and can take what the enemy intends for evil, the hurt and the pain, the suffering and the sadness and in his beautiful, powerful, sovereign way can use it for good. Can anybody say amen to that tonight? That is the story of the cross, that in the moment of staring at Jesus dying there, that three days later, that people could see in that resurrection story good news in the middle of bad news. It's the story of Easter. And we're going to talk a bit about that tonight. And I believe tonight, one of the things that the Lord wants to give you is not just a story that is out there, but He wants you to be able to personalize that story for yourself in here. I was having dinner uh, a couple of weeks ago with a, a young man from our church, actually. He's a, he's a husband, and he's a new father. And he's got one kiddo at the house, and he had just reached out, and he had asked to get a little bit of time together. He had some questions about being a husband, some questions about being a father. And uh, he came with a notebook. And, you know, this happens from time to time, but I love seeing this. A young man came with a notebook, and he had some questions. And he said, can I ask you anything? I said, yeah, ask me anything. And he did, he began to ask me anything, but then he asked me this question, and I loved it. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. You ready for the question? He asked me this question, and he said, Brad, he said, how has failure shaped your life? I was like, wow, that's a fantastic question. How has failure shaped my life? And I don't know if you're like this, but I'm a collector of good questions, and so I, I just, I gave him some answers about how I'd seen failure in my life. I'd seen failure as a young man. I'd seen failure in my parents' life that we're all a product of failure in our past. And really so much of our life is how we respond to failure. I look back at a lot of the things in my life, personally, I've been, have been failures, either personal failures or things that I have walked through and navigated. I can think about in my, in my sports background, it's been injuries or failures and it's, it's been hardships and a lot of life and maybe yours as well 
is how you've responded to failure. So I'm just going to pass that table across to you, or that question across the table to you tonight and ask you this. How has failure shaped your life? What failures are you in the wake of tonight, this Easter 2023? What are the things that you look at your life and maybe you're like, man, preacher, tonight I'm sitting here telling you I've got so many failures in my life I'm dealing with. But I, I just want, wonder if you might look at that question and think about Easter and the power of transformation that occurs at Easter, the power of the, the resurrection life of Jesus that could you believe tonight that God perhaps would want to look at your life and see what the enemy has intended for evil in your life not just in Jesus' life, but in your life, that God might want to use it for good, would have the power and the ability to transform that thing in your life or that wake in your life and use it for good. And so tonight what I would like to do in Scripture is I would like to look at the person of Peter in the Scriptures, and let's ask Peter this question. How, how has failure shaped your life, Peter? And let Peter from the Scriptures Share with us how failure has shaped his life, but how failure is not final. I want you to write that down. Failure does not have to be final. And the failures in our life don't have to mark us finally, that it's really a comma and not a period. And that was the case for Peter. And that's what he learned around the cross and the resurrection. And what is the upshot of the resurrection life of Jesus because he did resurrect, but it, it didn't just happen at a point in time. It's a resurrection that we are downstream from and that I believe God wants to mark our lives even now, the resurrection power in Peter's life. And so here's what I think. I think if you and I were to sit down with Peter and we were to say, hey, Peter, how has, how has failure marked your life? What's the worst moment of failure in your life I think Peter would sit down and he would think for a moment and he'd say, well, that's easy. I've had a lot of failures. There was that time Jesus called me Satan. I don't know if you remember that. He actually told him, he said, get behind me, Satan. He was not speaking in that moment on behalf of heaven. He was speaking on that moment on behalf of Lucifer. He actually told Jesus when Jesus said, I'm gonna go to the cross. He actually said, no, 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 you're not gonna, you're not gonna die. That You're not gonna die. And, and Jesus looked at him and said, Get behind me, Satan. So there was that moment. I mean, that would not be a win for sure, but I don't think Peter would take us there. Um, there was another moment. There was, a, there was a moment where he decided to cut off a guy's ear. It was on that first Easter. You remember that moment where they came to arrest Jesus and Peter tried to use his sword to cut off a man's ear? I don't think that was the moment of, of failure. It was close. I actually think Peter would take us to Caiaphas's house. He would take us to this garden he would take us right here. We've got a, a video of this place. It's actually, it's actually, there's a church built on it now. It's right here. And um, this is a church that is built on the actual location where Peter denied Jesus three times. And you can see it here in the, in the ruins of this location. This was where Caiaphas, the high priest, lived. He had all of his garden and all of his, his courtyard there. And this was the location where that night that Jesus was arrested and seized, he was taken here to kind of stand trial. And Peter followed, and we're gonna read this in Luke 22. Uh, but right before this moment happens, Peter was sitting with Jesus, and Jesus is actually telling the disciples what's about to go down. And in Luke 22, he has this to say to Peter. He says this in Luke 22, verse 31. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan... He's demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. But Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day. The sun won't rise until you deny three times that you know me. Just as a side note here, um, we have in the scripture two times where Peter tells Jesus what he's saying is wrong. One of them is when he says he's gonna go and die on the cross, and that was when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. It's recorded in Matthew 16. The other one is here, when he actually, he says that, you know, I've prayed for you, that Satan's asked to sift you. I've prayed that your faith would not fail, and Peter basically tells Jesus again, 
that, you know, what you're saying is not right. What you're saying is incorrect. And then Jesus, of course, says, no, you're going to actually deny me three times before the sun comes up tomorrow. And then if you are holding your Bible and you can look down at verse 54, this is what happens. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, on that first Easter, is praying, talking to his father, asking him to remove the cup. And Jesus says, but not my will, but yours be done. And in verse 31, it says, or excuse me, verse 54, it says this. Then the guards come up and they seize Jesus. They led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. That's the garden you just saw on the screen there. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them, and he was just warming up his hands. There was a, a servant girl seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, says, this man right here, he was also with him. Him is Jesus. Verse 57, but Peter denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. 58. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also were one of them. But Peter says, man, I am not, second time, 59. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly this man also was with Jesus, for he too is a Galilean, 60. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Now, I want you to follow along right here. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Hear the rooster. And then look at verse 61. It's one of the most sober verses in the scripture. And the Lord, Jesus, Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. So somehow they locked eyes. I don't know if Jesus is over here being tried or he'd just been whipped. But Peter denies Jesus for the third time. The rooster crows and they lock eyes across that courtyard looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. So, let's get back to the question. How has failure shaped my life, you ask? Well, Peter tells us this is my greatest failure. And he's downstream from this. And this failure right here was one of the most impactful failures on the life of Peter that we see in the scripture. This passage is full of shame. It's full of regret. It's full of all kinds of pain. And this is, again, we've got to remind ourselves, if you've grown up around church, you know that Peter was a disciple. He had been following Jesus for three years. If you're, if you're new to this uh, and, and you've not really leaned into this before, I want you to know, Peter was asked to follow Jesus three years previous, and he says yes to following Jesus. Jesus was his rabbi. Now, let me just tell you what the goal of being a disciple was. This is, this is the goal that Jesus had for Peter, okay? This is the goal of any disciple. Here's what a disciple is. A disciple's goal is to know what the rabbi knows, to do what the rabbi does, for the reason that the rabbi does it, in order to be just like the rabbi in his walk with God. So when Jesus looks at the disciples and he calls them to be a disciple, the goal, and this would have been very contextual 2,000 years ago in modern day Israel, the goal, this would have been first of all, a mind-blowing opportunity. This would have been the rarest of rare. Only like one-tenth of one percent of young Jewish men got the chance to be under a rabbi. There weren't a whole bunch of rabbis walking around. There was only a handful. And, and Peter, to be selected to be a disciple of a rabbi, this was absolutely mind-blowing. Only like the Harvard-educated elites would have gotten this opportunity. Only the smartest of the smart. And Peter, he was just a common fisherman. As a matter of fact, if you study the context here, more than likely, Peter and all of the other disciples of Jesus, they had already been cut. They had not been good enough to be in rabbinical school. They were studying under their fathers to be what their fathers were. As a matter of fact, when Jesus first meets Peter in Luke chapter 5 or in Matthew 4, you see him call Peter to come and be a follower, and Peter is with his dad. He's with his dad actually fishing, and he leaves his father to come and follow, 
okay? And his goal is to be just like the rabbi, to know what the rabbi knows, to speak the way the rabbi speaks, to make the same decisions the rabbi makes. That's the goal of a disciple. That's the goal. Now, fast forward three and a half years later, Peter is denying his rabbi three times. I want us to feel this. This would have been the absolute utmost shame-filled failure. It would have been like spitting in the face of your rabbi to tell him, Everyone around you, I don't even know who that is. This would have been like the worst of the worst. As a matter of fact, commentators actually, many of them believe that what Judas did in betraying Jesus and what Peter did in denying Jesus, that Peter had the greater sin. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that, but that Peter, doing this three times, doing this in this moment of greatest need, would have been the greatest amount of sin and shame you could have had. So if we were to sit down with Peter and say, how, how is failure shaped your life, he would have taken us right here. Now, the next thing that I want to ask is very simply this. If we were to sit down with Peter and say, now, Peter, how has success shaped your life? How, is, how has your life been marked by success? Well, do you know what? I think Peter would have taken us to another location. If, if we were to sit down with Peter and say, hey, how has success shaped your life? I think he would have taken us right, right here, right here. You say, isn't that the same location? And I would say to you, it's the exact same location. That this right here, this location where Peter denied Jesus is not only the greatest failure of Peter's life, but I believe it to be, listen to me, the greatest success of Peter's life as well. Not on the same night though. As a matter of fact, it was about six weeks later because this is the exact same location six weeks later, where this time Peter was actually the one being held in the prison cell here at Caiaphas' house. Because six weeks later, Peter and John have actually experienced something, the resurrection of Jesus, have experienced something, the Holy Spirit coming and filling them up, and now have experienced the good news of the gospel and are beginning to tell the whole world about Jesus' victory that very first Easter. This place that we were just looking at is not just the greatest failure in Peter's life, it's also the greatest victory in Peter's life. Here's what I want you to get. This is so, so important. Maybe you've even grown up hearing the Easter story. One of the things that I believe that the Lord wants to do for us is he wants to change in us our greatest spaces of being a coward and make us in that same space massively courageous. For Peter, this was the place of his moment of greatest denial, but this was also six weeks later, his moment of greatest declaration. Now, how did that happen? Uh, well, the scriptures tell us in Acts chapter four that Peter and John are actually post-resurrection, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're going to the temple. That they go to the temple one day, and on their way to the temple to worship, there's a beggar there begging for, for, for some money. Peter and John walk up and ask the young man, or excuse me, the older man, to look at them in the eyes and say, hey, would you look at me? And they say these words, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you freely. Stand up and walk. This paralyzed beggar that had been begging for years stands up and begins to leap and jump, and, and literally it was a miracle. The, the Bible records this at the end of Acts chapter 3. The, the beggar comes into the temple and everybody sees him. They know this man. This is the guy that was begging, has been begging for years, and they cannot deny the miracle. So people are going, what happened? Peter stands up and he begins to preach. He says, the way that this man was healed was because of the victory and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's one name under heaven by which man must be saved, and this is the name of Jesus Christ. He's the son of God. He wasn't just a rabbi. He was the Messiah. He was the I am. He is the son of God who resurrected and he's taken away the sins of the world. All of a sudden, all of these soldiers come in and they arrest Peter and John and they take Peter and John to the same exact location where they took Jesus the night before he was crucified on the cross. It's that same location we were just looking at. They take him to Caiaphas's house. And they stay there all night long, just like Jesus. And so here's what I want us to catch tonight. Can you imagine what the thoughts were for Peter and John as they're staying there in that cell? 
they know what happens to people that stay overnight in this cell. They just had seen it to their rabbi a few days earlier. They know that they're going to be tried. They know that perhaps they're going to be killed. And so they come out the very next morning and the Sanhedrin is gathered there to hold a trial. And upon this trial, they ask Peter and John, why are you preaching in the name of Jesus? Stop it, shut up, be quiet. And in the same courtyard where weeks earlier, Peter denied Jesus, he actually declares to all of the religious leaders, I cannot be quiet. I have seen too much. I've witnessed too much. I've seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I'm gonna have to tell you about him and you too need to repent. You need, you need to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and you need to repent for the forgiveness of sins. In Acts chapter four, verse 19, they tell him to be quiet, but look, it's recorded here in Acts four nineteen. Look what the scripture says. It says this, but Peter and John answered them when they asked why they were preaching and why they wouldn't be quiet. They said this, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, verse 20, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. In the same place where Peter was a coward, Peter was now courageous. In the same location, like drop a GPS pin, it's the exact same location where Peter was a denier, now Peter was a declarer. In the exact same spot. Now, okay, I understand, I got it, I'm with you, preacher. What are you, what's the point, what's the point? Here's what I want us to recognize. We've gotta ask ourselves the question, what was it that, that Peter had seen and heard? What was it exactly that he had seen and heard? I wanna share two things with you tonight on this resurrection weekend that changed Peter's life. And looking at me, I believe these two things are gonna change your life too. I believe these two things have the potential to completely reshape everything about your life whether you've grown up in church and you've heard this before or whether this is the first time you've ever experienced this news, okay? But here's what it's going to require. It's gonna require us to be honest and real for just a few moments, okay? So tonight, I know not tonight as much as tomorrow morning, but tonight, you're gonna leave this service. Maybe you're gonna go get something to eat and then you're gonna go home and you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna do the same thing I'm gonna do. You're gonna get out of your Easter clothes and you're gonna, you're gonna you know, just be real. Like we, we are all being real. And so here's what I wanna do tonight. I wanna just be real. Is it okay if I'm real with you guys tonight? Um, I don't know if, if you guys have had preachers that have felt like they're just projecting and, and talking to you about the good things in the Bible and, and projecting a life that's not honest and real. But here's the deal. Peter was honest and real and was truly exposed. And I wanna suggest to you that one of the things I believe that Christ wants to do for us this Easter is he wants us to be honest and real about our failures and shortcomings as well. And so can I, again, just ask you a question. Back to the beginning, what has been failures in your life that have shaped your life? And what if the greatest failures in your life, the greatest sins in your life, maybe things that nobody else knows about, what if God wanted tonight or this Easter weekend to use those as a weapon to redeem those things so that the kingdom of God might get the glory and the kingdom of God might advance in your life, in your family, and in your community. What if we stopped, listen, and I'm, I'm not saying we can do this, just side note, we're not very good at this. Uh, if you're not a Christian, you don't come to church often, I just wanna own up. We're not very good sometimes at being real. We love to dress up, to get done up, and to come in and say, how you doing? How you? I'm fine, I'm good. But when are we gonna be honest and say, we're not fine and we're not good, and we're all broken and we're all in need of a savior? Can we do that tonight? That, that is the good news of Easter, is that we don't have to fake it, we don't have to keep a front. We don't have to hide behind our blazers and our pastels. And by the way, I'm all for your blazers and pastels. I think they're fine and they look good. But when are we gonna take off the projection and gonna be honest with the reality that Jesus didn't die on a cross for theoretical sin. He died on the cross for my sin and yours. We've gotta be honest. And so here's the things that Peter saw that I believe we've gotta to see tonight. The first thing is he saw the resurrection of Jesus. He saw it. 
he saw Jesus Christ literally get tried in Caiaphas' house, get beaten in Caiaphas' house. He was the only one that was there. All the other ones had fled away. And and ultimately, until he denied him three times, he was experiencing the trial. He and all of the, the women specifically got a chance to see Jesus go stand before Pontius Pilate. The people cry out, crucify. And they saw Jesus carry his cross and die on that cross. They saw it. They saw him taken down off of the cross after the Roman soldier pierced him to make sure he was dead. The the Bible records that blood and water spewed from his side and they saw him wrapped up and placed in the tomb. They saw the tomb sealed and they mourned his death. They sat in the silence of his death. The same man that had resurrected Lazarus just a few days earlier was now dead. The same man that said he was the Messiah And the same man that they believed him to be the Messiah was now dead. They saw this. But they also saw on that morning when they came three days later to prepare the body, they saw that the stone was rolled away and there was no one there. The ladies saw it. They come running back to the disciples. Peter and John sprint to the tomb. They get to the tomb and what do they see, church? They see that it's empty. He is not there. The The women linger. Peter and John go back to tell the disciples that the body is not there. And one of the ladies, Mary, actually runs into the resurrected Jesus. Remember, she thinks he's the gardener. And then he reveals himself to her. She calls him Rabbi, Rabbi. And and he says, hey, go back and tell the disciples I'm resurrected. I'm going to see them soon. She does. And then later that exact day, Jesus shows up in the upper room where he just appears in the upper room with the disciples. Remember this? Um, One of the really cool things that they say is that Jesus just shows up there, the door is locked, is he actually eats some fish with them. Now this is kind of funny. Uh, Commentators call this an internal witness. It's one of the ways you can know the scripture is real. Jesus is there and he looks over at one of his buddy's plates and he goes, oh, is that some sea bass? Can I have some of that? And he has some fish. Do you guys have a friend that eats the food off of your plate? Anybody have that friend? Anybody have that family member that does that? Um, I don't know if you do. Dan Leanne is in the room right now. This is Dan Leanne. He never orders sweets, but he will always eat all the sweets that are left, okay? He's He's the friend that always waits to see what's on the plate, nibbles off your plate. Jesus must have been that friend too. He eats there, and then he tells them that he's he's gonna, you know, be doing some stuff, revealing himself and witnessing to others, but he wants to meet them in Galilee later. But I want you to see this. This is so powerful. Peter experienced the resurrection of Jesus. He saw that Jesus Christ had defeated sin and death, but here's what I wanna make sure you get because I think this is the biggest thing for this Easter service. That wasn't all that Jesus came to give Peter. He did not just come to reveal his resurrection. He also came, listen to me, to reveal his restoration. You see, Peter didn't just hear about the resurrection and see the resurrection. He also heard the restoration of Jesus. Now you say, what's the big deal? Well, I want you to know that I think it's the biggest of deals because I think that Peter had a massive, massive gap between understanding the resurrection of Jesus on one hand and the restoration of Jesus on the other. There was a massive gap from these two moments and points, okay? I think that this is probably where the majority of people that will attend church in South Carolina this weekend are. I think that there are literally tens of thousands of people that will go to heaven when they die. Listen to me, so important. They'll go to heaven when they die because they, like Peter, believed in the resurrected Christ. They have seen it. They have trusted it for the forgiveness of sins, they're they're looking forward to eternity, but Peter, he had this huge gap in his life between resurrection and restoration. He had this huge gap in his life between the moment Christ resurrected and, and the moment that Christ restored him. Huge, massive gap. And I think you see it when Peter goes back home to Galilee and he tells the disciples, I'm gonna go fishing. And all the disciples go fishing with him. Now, I'm gonna age myself in the room. How many people in the room think that Michael Jordan is the greatest NBA player of all time? Show yourself, where are you at? My people. All right, now how many people think it's anybody but Michael Jordan? 
All right, there's just a handful. Some of you aren't bold enough to believe this, okay? All right, now some of y'all will remember when Michael Jordan went back to back to back in the NBA, wins the world championships three times in a row, and then he decides he wants to play baseball. Anybody remember this? He decides he wants to go and play baseball. He, he goes and plays for the White Sox organization. He travels down to Birmingham, Alabama, and he plays for the Birmingham Barons. And while Michael Jordan was the greatest of all time in basketball, he wasn't the greatest of all time in baseball. And after a, a little run and he got all of that out, he calls a press conference, all right? And do you know what he says at this press conference? He calls a press conference. He, he sits down at the press conference and he looks right at the camera and he says these words, I'm going to play basketball. And people at the press conference start to clap. Um, people all over the place start to get excited. And sure enough, everybody understood what Michael Jordan meant when he said, I'm going to play basketball. Now, if I go home tonight, I say to my wife and kids, they'll ask, how did the service go? I'll say, it was great. There was way more people in the rain than I thought were gonna show up, but they're all here. They came for Easter, it was amazing. And then I say to my kids, hey guys, I'm going to play basketball. Do you know what my kids are gonna say? Are we gonna play pig or are we gonna play horse? You know, we'll go out in the backyard. No, dad, it's raining too hard. But you know what they're not thinking? They're not thinking I'm gonna have a career move. That's what they're not thinking. But when Michael Jordan sits down at the press conference and says, I'm going to play basketball, everybody knows, career move. And by the way, he went back to the NBA, played three more seasons in Chicago, and guess what he did, folks? He repeated back to back to back world championships again and the rest is history. Now, everybody else is playing for second place. That's not a part of the sermon any more than that. Stay with me. But I wanted to make sure I just went ahead and qualified Michael Jordan's the greatest of all time. So here's the whole point. Here's the whole point. When Peter tells the disciples that he's going fishing, that's not like me saying I'm going to play basketball. That's like Michael Jordan saying he's going to play basketball. He's, he's prompting to his disciples that there's a career shift. And here's what I want, to, I want to point out. What he's saying right here is that he's got a huge gap between the resurrection of Jesus and knowing that that's real, experiencing the resurrected Christ, and the restoration of what Jesus wants to do in his life. He, he, had, he had not experienced that yet. Listen to me. Peter believed that Jesus Christ had gotten out of the grave, just like many of us in this room. But what he did not believe was that Jesus Christ was going to do anything in and through his life. He was just gonna bide his time and work his years and get his retirement and then he was gonna experience resurrection life in heaven. But the in-between decades, he was just going to be a fisherman for the rest of his days. I wonder how many of us, if we were honest tonight, would be caught somewhere in this same gap. Where we've experienced the resurrection of Jesus, but we have not yet experienced the restoration of Jesus. And there's a gap between resurrection and restoration. And maybe in that gap, you can't believe, like Peter, he couldn't believe that Jesus could ever forgive the denial. Maybe in your gap, you have something else. I'll tell you what was in mind for a long, long time. The guy up here with the mic on, the thing that I believed, I believed in the resurrection of Jesus, I was a Christian, but the thing in between my gap was the fact that I was addicted to pornography for years. And so I thought that there was no way that that gap could be closed down because I could not stop doing something. Maybe addiction has marked your life. Maybe it's marking your life now. Maybe you've got plans tonight to open up the pill bottle or to drink that or to do whatever it is that you do that you can't say no to. Maybe addiction is the thing that's in the gap between resurrection and restoration in your life. Maybe it's not that. Maybe instead the thing in the gap for you is that abortion that nobody knows about that either you paid for or that you participated in and all the shame and all the regret that's attached to that, maybe that's a part of your life and your story. You believe in the resurrection of Jesus. You've trusted him for the forgiveness of sins and you're not gonna go to, to hell when you die. You're looking forward to heaven, but you're just settling for just doing the same old, same old until eternity because there's no way that you could ever experience the restoration of Christ. Maybe that's not it at all. Maybe it's the rage. Maybe it's the anger. Maybe it's the, the shame of the unforgiveness or the first marriage. 
Maybe it's that whole season of life, that first career. I don't know what it is, but here's the deal. I know that people in South Carolina at New Spring Church on this Easter weekend, many of us have a massive gap between resurrection and restoration. And here's what I want you to know. Jesus on an Easter weekend didn't come just to preach resurrection. He came to preach restoration. And when this happened for Peter, it changed everything. The the, the Bible actually says in Mark that Jesus shows up to some of the women after he resurrects and he says, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me back at the Sea of Galilee. Go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me back at the Sea of Galilee. That's why Peter and the disciples go back to Galilee and John 21 records that on a morning as the sun's coming up and the disciples, including Peter, have been fishing all night, which is not what you do, by the way, if you're just gonna wet a line. It's what you do if you've made a career change and you're trying to make money, you fish all night. After catching nothing all night, that they're still on the Sea of Galilee and that there's a shadowy figure on the beach who shouts out from the beach shore and says, little boys, have you caught anything? And they shout back from the middle of the sea, no. That same shadowy figure on the shore shouts out, cast your net on the other side. As soon as those words come out of that person's mouth, Peter knows that it's Jesus. Do you know why? Because he's heard those exact same words before. Back in Luke chapter five, Jesus had told Peter the exact same phrase, cast your net on the other side. And Peter did, and he hauled in a catch. And that's when he realized that Jesus was the son of God. The Bible records in Luke 5 that Peter falls down on his knees and he says, depart from me, rabbi, for I'm a sinful man. And Jesus doesn't depart from him. He actually says, no, come and be one of my disciples. Fast forward three years later, Jesus, I believe, are you looking at me? Jesus asked the disciples and Peter to go all the way back to the Sea of Galilee for this one reason, to start over again with Peter. The Bible doesn't record anything else that he does there other than this. Pursue Peter all the way back to the very beginning where he started on the same shore where he began three and a half years ago to ask him the same question. Would you come and follow me? Would you trust that I can restore you and I can forgive you? After breakfast on the beach that very morning where Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times. And Peter answers three times just like he had denied him three times, then Jesus reinstates him and he restores him. You see, New Spring Church, Jesus doesn't want you just to know that he's resurrected from the dead on this Easter weekend. He wants you to know that he's come to restore your most shame-filled parts, okay? He wants to not let you conceal and smuggle any shame into your future, He wants to actually touch and heal the very worst parts of you, the things that nobody else knows, because he wants to weaponize those things to use them for the kingdom of God for the rest of your days. That's exactly what he did with Peter, and I believe that is the Easter message that he has for you and I today. So what are those things? What are those things that you're ashamed of? What are those things that you try to forget about? What are those things that you try to turn the volume up on your life over and you don't want anybody to know about? And would you trust that this Easter weekend, Jesus has not come to embarrass you and neither do we, but rather that he wants to meet you in the middle of your most shameful denial and he wants to turn it around and cause you to actually declare the good news of Jesus from that same place. It was Peter's story and I believe it can be yours and mine today. So I've got two questions that I want to ask, okay? Here they are. Question number one tonight. Number one, have you seen the resurrected Jesus personally? Have you ever experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ for yourself? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him for the forgiveness of sin? And have you placed your faith in him and said, hey, I am not perfect. And good news, Jesus only saves not perfect perfect people. Again, is there anybody excited that Jesus only saves not perfect people? That's me. That's you. He only saves not perfect people. He's come to heal the broken, sinful, busted folks of the world. But that means we've got to look ourselves in the mirror. 
And we've got to stop looking out the window at everybody else. We've got to be honest and take off the dress clothes and just be honest. So tonight, maybe there's some of you that tonight needs to be the night that you put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Others of us, if you have placed your faith in Jesus at any point in your, t- in your life, I want to ask you this question. It's an honest one. In what place in your life do you need the restoration of Jesus? What's the place? Because we're all works in progress. We've all got things. For me, for me, 16 years ago, I needed Jesus to restore my addiction. I needed to own it. I needed to bring it out into the light. I needed to confess it. And it was upon that confession. Listen, and I, and I don't talk like this often because I'm not, I am not, again, bragging on any effort of my own. I could not, I confess out loud to you, I could not break the addiction I had. I couldn't. I tried. I tried everything. It wasn't until I confessed it to brothers that I ultimately experienced healing. And let me tell you what happened, church. Literally, it was like this, overnight. And I can say with incredible humility, but confidence in the victory of Jesus that I have not experienced, an, an, a, not a slip up, not a backslide, not, not a glance, not, a, not a, a, an alone moment on my computer at any point in my 16 years, I have been completely 100% restored and set free from that addiction. Jesus closed the gap from resurrection to restoration. And I believe that that's what he wants to do for many of you tonight. But it takes an honest moment, just a, just a moment of faith to say, God, I want that. I want restoration. I want forgiveness for all of it. So here's what we're going to do in our time of response. I want to invite you to your feet. All across the state, on every campus, and some of you, in just a moment, we're going to begin to respond. And I want to invite you, as the worship teams come, and they, and they create space for us to respond. Some of you, you need to make your way to the cross. And there's a cross in your room, and you need to place your faith in Jesus. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, tonight's the night. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe you came tonight with a loved one. Maybe you need to, to, to you know, go with them. and Ask them to go with you. They will, I promise. But you need to make your way to the cross and you need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. In just a moment when I pray, if that's you, I want you to feel free to move. And you're not gonna be alone, okay? Because here's the thing. Here at New Spring Church, every single week, We have so many folks that will respond in just a bit and they'll come and receive communion. They'll come and pray. They're gonna come to the altars. And so there's gonna be people moving all over your room. And so ministry teams, if you would, why don't you go ahead and move? And those folks are moving to these spaces to pray or serve communion and they're moving. If you're a Christ follower tonight, you've already placed your faith in Jesus, then here's what I want to invite you to do. Come and receive communion tonight. And maybe tonight you need to, like Peter, come and receive communion. Jesus' invitation. On that morning that he restored Peter, he invited him to breakfast. Peter jumped out of the boat. He met Jesus right there on the shore, and Christ already had breakfast prepared for him. He actually was cooking some fish. Peter had been fishing all night trying to get some fish, and Jesus had fish right there on the shore. Wouldn't it be just like our Lord that the thing we've been looking for, the satisfaction we've been pursuing, he's the only one that can give it to us. And he's got it for us tonight. It is in his broken body and it is in his blood poured out. This Easter reminds us that he wants to restore us. Maybe tonight you need to come and receive communion and you need to confess. We've got prayer stations. You can write your confession down on those prayer cards. You might want to pray with somebody. We've got prayer teams that would pray with you. If you want to see the gap of resurrection and restoration close, then confession is the good gift God has for you. Talk to somebody about what you're dealing with. Don't leave the building tonight carrying the shame and guilt into the future because, listen, Peter didn't go back to be a fisherman. He actually became a shepherd. And that's exactly the way he talks. He doesn't go and fish. He actually goes and he begins to be a shepherd. And I believe that Jesus doesn't want you just to go back to that old lifestyle and just trust for eternity one day. He wants you to experience the restoration, spirit-filled life where you actually accomplish beautiful things with Christ in you. Don't just believe in a resurrection of Jesus. Believe in the resurrection power of Jesus in you. Amen? So I'm gonna pray. And then I want you to take a moment to ask God what it is you need to do. 
And feel the freedom in this room to not just play Easter dress up, but to come and respond to the good news of Jesus. So Father God, I pray right now that you would meet us right where we are, just like you met Peter. That you would close the gap between resurrection and restoration for every one of us. Lord, I pray for anyone who's feeling shame tonight as your Holy Spirit has been prompting them. Lord, would you allow them to see the difference between the condemnation and the voice of the enemy who just wants to hold them under his thumb, condemning and heaping shame and guilt for the rest of our lives? Would you help them to recognize the voice of your Holy Spirit up and against the voice of condemnation? Romans chapter 8 tells us very clearly that we don't have to live ashamed when we're in Christ because there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, that there is only forgiveness and grace. And Peter experienced that. And so, Lord, I pray you would pour your mercy and grace out on every single one of us as we come up under your forgiveness, your resurrection power, and your restoration power as well. Lord, I pray that confession would be the good gift in which you intended it to be for us. That as we have honest conversations in this Easter season with loved ones or friends or pastors, that, Lord, your people would be activated in a powerful way, just like you activated the church 2,000 years ago. And that we would see what they saw. Literally hundreds and thousands of salvations added to their numbers. Miracles as people walked in the forgiveness of sin, the healing of physical ailments, that we would see that again, Lord, because we're walking in confession and we're walking not just in resurrection power, but in restoration power. Do it, Lord. Do it tonight as we come to your table and we receive your restoration. I ask all of this in Christ's name and I pray, amen, amen. Take a moment, make a plan and feel free to move after you have talked to the Lord. It's your turn. Well, thank you so much for joining us online uh, this Easter weekend. And I want to invite you to respond. What a powerful and moving message. I want to ask you, uh, how is God moving in your heart right now? Uh, Maybe you recognize that you need to receive the resurrection of Jesus or there needs to be some restoration in your life. And we want to walk with you through that. So if you would text church online to 30303 and it's going to send you a form. You can fill that out and we can connect with you through prayer or walk with you through salvation and other next steps. We'd love to walk with you uh, as this message was so moving. I want to invite Brad in. Thank you so much for that that great word, man. I'd love for you just to share. Share a little more with our, with our online audience. Specifically, I think that, that resurrection and restoration gap, what else would you want to share with them? Well, I just want to say, hey, I hope you're doing well wherever you are. And I just wanted to honestly share something that happened this last week. Uh, just a week ago, I had somebody reach out who was in the hospital. And so they weren't able to be at church. And they were actually watching online. And they actually did exactly what you just prompted. They prayed um, and they sent that prayer request in right there if you'll just text the number 30303 that phrase church online they put their prayer request in and and they experienced some encouragement this week so I just want you to know we'd love to pray with you wherever you are and I just want you to know that I believe that that is the primary message this Easter for us is that God doesn't want us to just experience the resurrection of Jesus which is kind of crazy right just the resurrection, that there's even more, that that's actually the start, the first domino, so that we might know not just resurrection, but restoration, that Jesus would pursue us all the way to the very darkest, most shame-filled places of our life. That's what he did for Peter. That's what he's done for me. I know that that's what he's done for many others, and I believe that that might be what Jesus wants to do for you this Easter season. So would you, would you listen to the voice of Christ, the encouraging voice of Christ, and not let the enemy keep his shame on you? Don't let condemnation stay on you, but instead, come and lay that down. I believe that that's what Jesus has for many of us this Easter season. Amen. I mean, if you live close enough to one of our campuses in South Carolina, I want to invite you Uh, into the ministries of our churches to come join us. Next week, we're starting a series called Creed. And I just want to say, the the ministry of the church is the ministry of reconciliation and helping us all walk in the restoration that Jesus offers us. That's right. And that's available to you. We want to do this together as a body of Christ. So would you join us next week as we start our Creed series? Thank you, Brad. Let me bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you this Easter season. May he make his face to shine upon you and, and lift up his countenance towards you and give you great, great, great peace. Be blessed.